Oh boy, this has been one wild day today. Just got off the, uh, I think we did radio. It was like Nationwide with Charlie Kirk. And you know, Charlie gets you into these subjects. I can't believe he just, he just sucks you right into the controversy. But we got into Rob Reiner and his crazy movie targeting people like me. Uh, but we also talked about the Lakeland Church shooter. Did you know that it was a transgender immigrant from El Salvador? That You got to get that because Rob Reiner says, you know, you're dangerous, but it's actually the shooter at the church uh, was a transgender immigrant. But then we were talking about who funded the woke uh, commercials on the uh, Super Bowl. And then we, we got into it on John Maxwell and, and the surprising um, position he's taking on churches going quiet this year on politics. So we got a wild show. And I'll tell you what, if it's indication of anything, it's that this is going to be Super Bowl time for the church. It says game time, people. And it's, uh, it's time that you actually took a look. And I said this before. You've heard me push this before. We've got a window where I think there's grace on America. You want to stabilize your finances, stabilize your strategy for going through the shaking of the future. And you want to go to lancewallet.com forward slash Birch. Why? Because Birch Gold is a place where you could put your, your retirement money or your dollars into something that is actually going to float with the challenge the economy is going to go through. And now's the right time to do that. You want to go to lancewallet.com forward slash Birch. If you don't understand it, the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Read the 20-page report. Get it for free at lancewallet.com forward slash Birch. Now let's go into the incendiary inferno that takes place when you do a program with Charlie Kirk. Lance, can you push back on this generally? I want to wait back for radio for you to kind of go after this next individual and to criticize them. But more broadly, what is your response when people say, Lance, I just want to preach the gospel. This is dividing the kingdom. It's too nasty right now. I just want to preach the gospel. Fascinating study was done by a thesis uh, written by a PhD student who wanted to see what was preached in the United States during the Civil War. In the North, they were preaching the justice and the righteousness of emancipating the South from slavery. In the South, they were preaching the, un the injustice of the North, forcing them to uh, comply with their federal government control. The border states, Charlie Kirk, preached, stay out of politics and focus on the kingdom. What that tells me is that almost all churches today are like Maryland or Kentucky or Delaware. They are border state churches that are acting political because the winds of uh, adversity are making them tack in such a direction that they will not provoke anyone by speaking truth. These are border state pastors mm. and churches. And the, the psychology is what fascinates me of people that remain on the fence and remain on the border. Where did this begin to go wrong, Lance? Because the American church used to be very political a couple decades ago. Yeah, it went, I'll tell you where it went south. It went south when America had a prolonged period of peace and prosperity and didn't recognize the threat of the left. I have a 1983 leadership magazine which captures the seminal moment when Jack Hayford and Rick Warren were discussing that the best way to change America in the culture war is to build better churches and more churches where they preach the gospel. Meanwhile, it was D. James Kennedy and others that said, well, while you're doing that, pray to God that the Marxists don't take over America because they will shut down your church within 30 years if you pursue that. You're called to disciple the nation and win souls, not just build churches. Mm. That moment captured the future trajectory of America. You know, there recently, and I would like your uh, response to this, just the last couple of days, uh, one of the branches of Willow Creek Community Church is closing. I, I passively used to attend Willow Creek Community Church in the suburbs of Chicago. Bill Hybels was a great communicator, especially as a new Christian. But as you dive deeper, you realize that there, there wasn't a lot of depth there. But initial stages, I have to say, he was very helpful to me. Do you think, though, the Willow Creekification of the American church was a negative thing, where it came in overly corporate, you know, stay away from the controversial oh, issues? Can you— Listen, I, I, was, I worked for a while as a church growth consultant. I was actually in—you know, we had a Wall Street company. I was in the oil business. When I went into ministry, 
I would moonlight as a consultant and help help or nonprofits grow. So there was a cottage industry of how to grow a church. It's an entrepreneurial phenomena, how to get the traffic in, have seven points of contact, and, and when they come in so that they feel as though they're, and there really is a strategy to building a business. Or, so what happened is church growth became a managerial science. But what we didn't recognize is that building bigger churches did not build more influence in culture. We neglected what the left was doing on the campuses that you're making up for now in your generation. We neglected that media was being taken over by the left. And because we didn't understand how how, how the devil will fill the void of our negligence, we built big churches. And then another mistake happened. Toronto for Pentecostals and Charismatics, the fastest growing wing of Christianity globally happens to be Pentecostal, uh, spirit-filled and that kind of stuff. And and so you have a Toronto, Pensacola, uh, various moves of God, and this became the alternative. If you weren't into church growth, you were into the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And so both of them created ditches. Neither of them would go into the seven mountains of culture. And so for 25 years, I'd be like the lone prophet saying, if we don't go into media, it's going to be taken over. If we don't go into politics, oh, they're going to chuck you down. And I, pro- I prophesied it, and now I'm watching it happen. And, and a little bit late to the game, people are going, you know, I think you have a point. We got to get involved. Yeah, no kidding, you got to get involved. Email us, freedom at charliekirk.com. Lance, stay right there. In about 30 seconds, we'll welcome our radio audience back, and I want you to criticize us a major leader uh, in the Christian. I don't want you to. I know that you're planning to, and I, I, I want to get into that because it's someone that I've read and that I've respected, but he has, uh, he's saying something that's pretty damaging right now. I want to take a moment to talk about the volatile financial time that we're in, and I want you to empower yourself with knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge, the Bible says. Visit lancewalla.com forward slash birch and get a free information kit. Consider discussing how to shift your 401k or your retirement account into a tax sheltered gold and silver account. Why don't you go to lancewalnout.com forward slash birch right now and take action for a secure future. Lance, uh, you mentioned this in the uh, pre-show. Uh, there's a person in major church Christian world that is saying we shouldn't get involved in politics. Do I have that right? You have it exactly right, Charlie. This is really challenging for me to share this. It's kind of like uh, when a Catholic disagrees with the Pope. Uh, You know, you really think about how hard you're going to go on the subject. But I have been a student of uh, leadership development. You know, I've got a consulting company, business background. And one of the key leaders who the church has embraced as an almost Solomon-like guru for success and wisdom has come out powerfully shutting down churches from engagement in the political crises of our century. So I'll read to you. I found this out from a pastor who had attended, and they wrote to me and said, I was attending a uh, pastor's conference where churches with 1,000 or more people. So we're talking about the strong churches. Mm -hmm. We heard over and over again, we are not to say anything that can be taken as political or controversial. Pastors are not to be involved in politics at all. Pastors should not be involved in politics because it divides people. And the clear message, just love people, which goes to that, you know, Jesus didn't preach hate thing, right? Just love people and don't do anything that would divide people. John Maxwell stunned me with his strong rebuke of those who take a political stand or position in this hour. We are to be silent in the face of evil. Maxwell made it clear that if you bring up anything political, if as a pastor you bring up anything political, you are trusting politicians rather than Jesus. We have to deal with that right now. You're trusting politicians rather than Jesus. And so she said the worst part, is that pastors at the conference kept leaning over all around me and saying, this is so good, this is gold, this is so good. They're all like encouraging each other because they all are border state pastors right now and they're thankful they don't have to deal with the issue of slavery. So it's pretty clear, don't be political, just preach the gospel. Shame on you if you're political. You don't need Christians to be political. Oh my gosh, we don't need Christians to bring, we need Christians to bring people together, not divide. So um, what is your thought? First of all, how would you answer that, Charlie? Are we well, trusting I, I mean, in- how I would answer this, I'd say, how dare you, John Maxwell? They just locked down the church for a year and a half to two years, and you're telling us not to be political? 
I mean, marijuana dispensaries and liquor stores remained open in strip clubs and more people killed themselves and got addicted to alcohol and drugs. And you as a leadership development coach have the gall to get up on stage and tell people to not be political. No, politics came into the church. They locked down the church. They, they labeled the church not essential. It divides us. No, they divided us. There you go. This is a guy I used to respect. Who like? Well, you how know, dare and, he? And, honestly, and, 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 like he's he's preaching. Pat, he's teaching. Pat, I'm going to call him. This is this is outrageous. If he actually said well, what this person said. Yes, exactly. And 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 the reason why this is so important is because you know you look at the. Uh, I remember Rush Limbaugh talked about at the Super Bowl the NFL owners. He's, he was he he said they're really stuck because it's like CEOs in America. They're hearing something, and they believe that what they're hearing is true and represents uh, uh, America. What these pastors need to know, and what John Maxwell needs to find out right now, is that the majority of Americans in the pew are not going to be politically correct because political correctness is killing America. The inability to speak the truth regarding whether a man is a man or a woman is a woman is, is choking us. So the uh, the idea that uh, we are that we are seeking a solution in politics rather than from heaven is the opposite of the reality, which is we are praying to God for help, and God is giving us a mechanism with which to influence the future of America by electing people that reflect our values. If you don't show up in this uh, in this political battle, then you are actually voting. For the devil to take over America. And these pastors that are being told not to take, take a stand, what they should be told is, you don't ever have to be obnoxious or divisive. You're not in the business of doing that any more than Jesus was. But you are in the business of learning and developing the skill and the acumen to teach your people how to think biblically and vote biblically. That's their job. So was this at a, this was at a church leadership development conference? That this was he a, said this? this. This was at a uh, denominational conference. Do we have a video of it that we could get our hands on? Well, I'll bet you. You know, I'll bet you right now. As soon as your broadcast goes out, they'll clamp that thing down. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it's an Assembly of God denominational of conference. All, I must. Th those I must used to be ahead. the most politically engaged and involved, Lance. I didn't know that, but but think about that. So it's an Assembly of God. If, so this basically would be the most influential. Here's my, uh, here's my point. Everyone listening to this broadcast, if you go to an Assembly of God church that has a thousand or more people, you need to let your pastor know that you're standing behind them, speaking boldly, courageously, and with wisdom to educate the church on uh, biblical citizenship and what, and what the word of God says on the issues that are gonna be debated in this election. You've got to do it because what Maxwell's saying is, ironically, stay out of politics, pastor, which tells the pastor to be a politician in the pulpit. Well, it's also, but does that, so I ask John, I mean this sincerely, and John Maxwell is welcome to come on the program and defend it. Do you stay out of morality? Do you not teach the Ten Commandments? Do you just say, hey, we're not, we don't want to divide people, so we're just going to say that homosexuality is fine, and we're going to oh, say yeah, transgenderism I, 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 is fine, I, I, child rape I'll is fine? I think you're right. I think it goes right to the root of an error my generation committed, which is we thought if we focused on building the church and staying positive and avoiding controversial issues, we could gather a bigger crowd and then influence them to be better Christians, and they would therefore influence the nation to be more Christian. It didn't work. What, uh, you'll find Dallas, Texas, for instance, has more mega churches than you know Mecca has mosques, I assume, but uh, we, but the church has been absolutely impotent in shaping the influence of the left-wing agenda in the schools or in uh, or in Dallas, Texas. And the only time we've ever we ever took ground was when the church raised up an awareness yes. of what's going on on the school boards and took them over. I I, I just want to know very clearly from John Maxwell. Is it wrong for a pastor to say from the pulpit that 13-year-olds shouldn't get chemical castration or what's called gender reassignment surgery? Is that being political? Or is, I mean, does that divide people? Is it wrong for a pastor to say 
in an individual counseling session, the position of this church is that your 15 year old should not take hormone blockers or testosterone replacement therapy. I'm just wondering, is that uh, we don't do that because we're not political. I mean, yeah, and, the, by, what, what, and by the way, how many senators I've heard this from people in Congress and the Senate, they said, you know what, we'd be a lot bolder if you guys were a lot bolder. In other words, that philosophy takes a person who hears the call of God to run for public office and they courageously go out and get slandered, have research done on their background, any sin they've ever committed is now public knowledge, and they do it out of obedience to the call of God and the church doesn't support them because they've been taught by this philosophy that you don't get involved with politics. And because we're not involved with politics, we're creating a vacuum and the devil will fill a vacuum. Dude, that's exactly right. And it just it just sounds so good because you stay from stage. Oh, you know, don't get involved in this. You know, that's my but it's just it falls apart immediately. So my next question to John Maxwell would be, OK, let's say that the city of Atlanta says that church is non essential again because there's some abstract virus. How would you react to that, John Maxwell? Do you think it was OK that the church was labeled non essential? Was it a political statement right, to right. respond to or, that? Or, or let's go ahead and say we end up going in the direction of Canada. And now in the pulpit, yes. it's considered hate speech for you to actually advocate for um, traditional marriage values because it's interpreted as, uh, as, as, as intolerant of gay marriage. So are you going to say avoid that subject uh, because or now here's what I think John Maxwell will do. Because John is a brilliant guy. I mean, I studied him. He's mentored me. I was almost a Maxwell coach. I was just too busy to, to do the certification. Here's what I, he will probably say. I, I never said what you said. I, I merely pointed out that getting involved with, and he'll, he'll qualify it, and then he'll make the statement that, of course, I believe Christians should be vocal in their witness, and they could serve in business. I've got all these CEOs, corporations. I believe Christianity fits. Here's the point that I would make. These pastors did not walk away with that impression. Their 18-year-old daughter sat there, and instead of getting strength from a leader like Maxwell, instead of these pastors feeling infused with fresh vigor and vitality for the battle of America, they're all going away high-fiving each other, saying, I'm not going to bring up Trump or anything that's controversial. That 18-year-old went with her heart busted up because our generation, my generation, the reason why I'm so moved by this is I look at you, Charlie, and I say, you're the generation we screwed up. We're handing off to you our negligence. It's all the cumulative wisdom of my generation building big churches and seeking revival that has left you a culture in collapse, and I apologize. John, stop saying you didn't say what you said. Yeah, and there's no need to apologize, Lance. It's because we had a great country, and we did what every great country does, which is you get passive and you focus on the immediate and all of a sudden the enemy never rests. And now it's time for action. What I won't accept though, is I won't accept people living in denial that everything's fine. You know, I, I, I don't love this idea where, you know, baby boomers need to like perpetually apologize for stuff. It's like, okay, if you're in the fight now, no need. What I can't stand is for people to say, don't fight, don't fight. That I, th that, that I find to be morally repulsive. Yep. And that's, and that's the reason why you and I are going to be going out this year. And, and for every date that I can get you out there, we're going to be doing a thing called the Courage Tour. Because this kind of Maxwelling is what produces anxiety. What we need is courage. More than ever before, we need to be like Joshua, be bold and courageous. Yes. Because God is giving us a moment to... to Let's say that there's an extension of grace coming to America. There's a period where God is going to push back on the madness. I can see it happening, even in the Super Bowl ads, as woke as they were, uh, the Bud Light moment did wake up corporate America. And they realized maybe we're getting, maybe our consultants are out of touch with America because America is not left. America is center right. It needs courageous no, right. leadership. That's right. Lance, stay right there. Okay, Lance. Uh, Lance, I know you have a whiteboard somewhere, right? So we have I uh, do. We have eight minutes. We have three and five. So you go. I'll cut you off in about three minutes. 
You want me to go to the whiteboard right now? Yeah, go go do the crawl rove thing. All right, uh, Lance is uh, <laughs> he's going to get some sort of a whiteboard here. Let's. I, that's it's what the, a nice it's studio. It's the crawl rove thing. I love it. All right, show it. All right. So here's the deal. I I I just I I was so upset with this John Maxwell situation that I went to a big church in Carolina, and a lot of them have had John there in their churches. So they were really mad at me, but I said, listen, you have to understand how do you approach the political? You pastors have to have a better strategy. You don't have to approach it the way that they're talking about. Start with what does the word of God say? So here's the Bible. What does the word of God say? Because that forms your principles. And those that are listening, instead of seeing this, I just writing principles. Now your principles should shape your policies. Policies about marriage, policies about life, policies about debt, $35 trillion, policies about your borders. Your policies create a platform. Your platform is what your party is going to run on. Your candidates are under the litmus test of the platform based on policies rooted in principles that are biblical in their worldview. And finally, you have a personality. And that becomes your politician or your candidate. This is the iceberg, look at it this way. The iceberg goes like this. All of this area, platform, policy, principle is under the surface. Everybody will focus on a Democrat and a Republican. Don't let the battle be about the personality. Focus on the platform, the policies, and above all things, pastors, teach biblical principles, because if you do that, the rest takes care of itself. If you avoid these subjects because it's not good for church growth, you might lose your people to the pulpit that is preaching what God calls them to say. That's my thought, Charlie Kirk. That's beautifully well done. So, so Lance, where do the, just really quick, about 45 seconds, where do most people go wrong in that, on that ladder, that ascension from the Bible? Where, where is the greatest fault? It, the greatest fault, George Barna Research. We have the data on this. We study it. 90% of people in the church want to hear their church talk about the biblical basis for heterosexual versus homosexual marriage, the yes. biblical basis for life versus abortion. They're asking their pastors to talk about things the pastor refuses to talk about because John Maxwell says avoid it. It's amazing. Stay right there, Lance. We're going to welcome back our radio audience in about 30 seconds. So Lance, build this out as marching orders. Trump is going to be the nominee. There, I, I truly believe that there is an effort to try to trim the, the Christian support. What is your argument? How should we approach this strategically? The strategy is, listen, every, every state you're going to have to engage. I think sometimes Christians make the mistake of thinking, that uh, the national is where their focus is. The truth of the matter is you have disproportionate influence locally. Therefore, we believe, and Charlie's kind of convinced me of this in his own persistent way, <laughs> that there are certain key states yes. and certain key counties. Thank you, Therefore, Lance. everyone must do a full court press locally. Yes. But there are going to be Arizona and Wisconsin and Georgia. I think Michigan's back in play. Uh, I grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is, 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 has, a, has a potential there. Carolina, Nevada. Look, what I'm listing is 19 counties, seven or so key states, and we want to go focus the battle on those very frontline places. And so what, when, you get, when you get into the details on this stuff, and you all ought to learn this because you're a smart audience. I, I love the, the audience you've got. There, there are counties where you have underperforming Christians. And it's weird. We got data. In other words, conservatives and Christians should be showing up at this level, but they underperform. You know why? Well, maybe they don't know the urgency of the issues. Maybe they're, maybe they're not even involved with the church and they're only listening to the secular news. They're misinformed. Or, or maybe they need you. So what we're doing, Charlie, is uh, we're working with you guys in order to help mobilize these churches that can be awake that we can help uh, to strengthen you. You're going to grow. This year, there's going to be church growth for people that are patriots. We want to mobilize the people that are in your church to be able to be strengthened in their worldview, getting those principles, and then mobilized in these counties. We really do want to go out. 
and be able to, uh, to have an effective impact on getting people that don't vote to vote and to, and to, and to be educated on a biblical perspective of how to vote. And, and just for the non-evangelicals in the audience, the non-Christians, talk about how powerful this group once was, Lance, in, in the 80s and 90s. And it's been, te- it's been, if it gets back to where it was, what, what, what does that look like? Well, let, let me tell you something. When Billy Graham, so I was born in 1956, Billy Graham uh, came on the scene and uh, the evangelical church and churches Uh, mainline denominations exploded in growth in the 50s and 60s. And the reason why that happened is because there was such a trauma of World War II and the the realization of mortality was on people's minds that the threat of of the standoff with a nuclear-powered Russia, the threat of communism, it it had so uh, saturated. I remember when I was a kid, we did bomb drills and got under desks. Imagine how traumatizing it is when you're a kid and it's like, okay, kids, it's time when the atomic bomb drops. Remember, go under your desk. And we all go under the desk till the teacher says, you can come out now. It's like, okay, like that's actually going to stop radiation from touching you. So we were primed to believe in our mortality and that there were nations at stake. Billy Graham came on the scene, Charlie Kirk, and he captured the zeitgeist of that moment and he preached to America that if it didn't repent, it was on the balance with the judgment of God and atheistic communism was right ready to take us over. And it could even be a nuclear moment that transitions America. Well, the move of God happened. Billy Graham meets with Eisenhower and says, we need the president and we need a national prayer breakfast. We need to stand together. So Eisenhower puts in God we trust on the currency. Think about this nowadays. This is the influence of Christianity and its strength. And the focus wasn't on forcing people to have to do Christian stuff. It was on giving people the awareness that God is real and that your soul is immortal Amen. and that you must walk with the word of God. That's, that's what shaped America. And then we went from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. We went into church growth and revival and neglected the culture. Amen. Lance, excellent work. Thank you so much. And we'll be fighting in the trenches together this uh this year thank you so much actually it'll be i'm looking forward to it i think i think it's going to be a great year amen it's gonna be great lance thanks so much what happens if a natural disaster takes place we have these weird tornadoes that hit in the midwest and in texas but look at the hurricanes in florida people can literally have their uh, houses flooded or they're in a situation where they have no food or access to groceries everyone needs at least a four-week emergency food kit And fortunately, My Patriot Supply has created a four-week emergency kit. And these products will last for 25 years. The interesting thing is they give you a 2,000 calorie per day uh, meal. And that's the key. Delicious and 2,000 calories a day, because that's what you're going to need to sustain yourself for four weeks in a crisis. We had uh, a winter freeze here in Texas, of all places. And we had a couple of days where we had no electricity. I'm telling you something. This makes a huge difference. Mushroom rice pilaf, fluffy rice and mushrooms, seasoned with red wine and herb. And then how about starting the day off? Maple Grove oatmeal, old-fashioned oats, maple flavoring with a pinch of brown sugar. This is what you want to do. Four-week emergency food kit, and that's just for you. Think about your children. Guarantee somebody around you is going to need help. You're going to want to at least have the four-week emergency kit. Go to lancewalla.com forward slash patriot. Use that link and you're going to get a special discount on their special four-week emergency kit promotion. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.